was a kid, it took me forever to get to sleep at night. I'd lay in bed for hours, and finally, when everyone else was asleep, I'd sneak down the stairs to the bookshelf, and I'd read the encyclopedias. Over and over again, I'd read about the brain and muscles and the skeletal system, digestion, anything I could find that pertained to the human body. And I dreamed of being a doctor. So I couldn't wait to turn 14, because it meant that I could start volunteering in the hospital. So by the time my birthday came, I had my application filled out, I had my little white shoes in hand, and I was ready to go. And I loved volunteering in the hospital. I loved the environment, I loved making relationships with patients, and I loved doing any little thing that I could to help. I was also a competitive gymnast when I was a kid, and one day, a dancer came into the gym to help us with our floor exercise routines. And I found myself completely lost in movement in a way that I never had been before. I felt a joy and a high that I had never experienced. It was transcendent, and I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that I wanted to experience that every day for the rest of my life. I knew that I had to dance. And so my path toward medicine took a sharp turn toward the arts, or so it seemed. In the end, those two paths would actually end up in the same place. And as I look back now, I can see a number of experiences that foreshadowed or helped shape what became my understanding of the connection between medicines and the arts and of why medicine needs the arts. One of those experiences happened when I was at Interlochen Arts Academy, where I was studying dance in my senior year of high school. I woke up one morning when my roommate, a vocal major, screamed. She was up early studying, and the shelf that she had put the hot pot on fell. She received second and third degree burns and began what became months of really excruciatingly painful treatment in the hospital. A few months before that, I had given her a Joni Mitchell tape. And when she was going through those treatments, she would turn that tape up loud and sing at the top of her lungs. And in that way, as she described to me, she would transcend and survive her pain. I didn't think much about that experience or the concept of transcendence until quite a few years later in 1994 when I became an artist in residence with the UF Health Shands Arts and Medicine program and I met a patient named Burtis. Burtis has sickle cell disease which means that she also experiences a great deal of pain. When I met Berta, she was six years old, and she quickly fell in love with dancing and learned to use it to cope with her pain. When she was young and we danced together, she could forget about her pain. She was completely distracted from it and could have fun. And as she got older, her pain got worse. One day, when she was 14 years old, her attending physician called me and said that she had been admitted to the hospital with a particularly bad pain crisis. So I went to see her. And when I walked into her room, she didn't hear me come in. So I leaned over her and said, Hi, Burtis, it's Jill. Would you like to dance? And that, of course, would seem like a ridiculous question to anyone looking in, but it made sense to Bertus, and she said yes. And so slowly she sat up, and I helped her begin to move her arms. And then she slipped easily into a deep state of concentration and began what became about an hour of beautiful and fluid movement. And at the end of that time, she looked like this. The photographer who was with me that day asked Burtis, 
what happens to your pain when you're dancing? And she said, it's still there, but I don't care because I feel so good. Later that week, we were dancing again, and Bertus's attending physician came into the room. We didn't notice, but he sat down and he watched for about 20 minutes. And when he left, he went and he put a big note at the front of her chart, and that note said, dancing works better than meds, call arts and medicine. And so after that, when Bertus was admitted to the hospital, I would get a call and we would schedule time for me to go and dance with her. And per her request, they would reduce her pain meds by about half because she wanted to be really clear and present for her dancing. And after we would dance together, she was able to maintain that lower dose of medication, usually into the wee hours of the night. Bertus was one of my greatest teachers. She was incredibly adept at getting into that flow state, that space in which artists make their most authentic work. It's what artists strive their whole lives to be able to do. Bertus is a master of flow state, that space in which we're completely focused, in which we lose track of time, and when one action just moves effortlessly to the next. And we know that when we engage in that kind of flow state, we can elicit a relaxation response. And that's the opposite of fight or flight, the stress response. And when we experience that kind of relaxation response, our immune system can actually work more effectively. Curtis also taught me about another concept that makes the arts very useful to medicine. As human beings, we have limited cognitive capacity. We can only pay attention to so much at one time. So while we think we're great multitaskers, we actually aren't. And that can work in our favor as well, because when we're experiencing things like pain and anxiety, if we can focus our attention on something like an engaging creative activity, we can reduce the experience of pain and its effects. Imagine being admitted to this room in the emergency department in the midst of an unexpected health crisis or illness and an artist in residence walks into your room. Hello. <laughs> I'm Ricky, I'm with the Arts and Medicine program. Would you like to hear a song today? Art changes us. We know that when we experience art, either actively or passively, 
that we get a rush of endorphins, those wonderful brain chemicals that reduce pain and stress. You may be feeling a bit of that now. And we also know that we get a rush of dopamine, another one of those feel-good brain chemicals. We've been hearing more about dopamine because a reduction in dopamine is responsible for the movement challenges that people with Parkinson's disease experience. In the past few years, studies have demonstrated that dancing can actually help address some of those symptoms, like tremors and rigidity, balance and range of motion. Judy Whitmore has had Parkinson's disease for more than 20 years. Judy dances every day. She dances every day, and she can do this because she just keeps doing it. Dancing keeps her physically able to move. It brings her tremendous joy. It connects her to others. And when she's dancing, Judy is thriving. We offer three dance classes every week in our dance studios at the University of Florida. This program called Dance for Life was created through a partnership between the arts and medicine programs at UF and the UF Center for Movement Disorders and Neurorestoration. In the spirit of a research university, we brought clinicians, our neurologists, and occupational therapists, and physical therapists, along with our dancers, into our dance studio, our laboratory. And we created a dance class that we knew would be safe, and fun, engaging, and help address both the challenges and goals of people with Parkinson's disease. This is not a fake dance class. This is a real full-on dance class where people with Parkinson's disease and dance majors dance together and they're challenged physically and artistically. We also offer a singing class for people with Parkinson's disease every week. One of our participants, Kathy Castle, understands that there's a therapeutic reason for singing when you have Parkinson's disease, which can diminish the voice over time. But it's not why she comes to class. She comes to class because she can sing without worrying about being on key, for the pure joy of singing, and for the days when someone new comes in and mourning for the loss of a singing voice, she goes from a croak to a beautiful song and has a piece of her soul restored. Art can help us feel whole. Wholeness and well being are deeply linked. In fact, well being can be defined as a sense of wholeness. Viktor Frankl and Abraham Maslow in the 1960s wrote about a concept they called self-transcendence. Self-transcendence is when we experience something and it expands our conceptual boundaries. When we shift, we see ourselves differently or we see the world differently. It's why we go to see the Grand Canyon and to see great works of art. We're expanded in that way. It's that high that I experienced in the dance studio that day. I once worked with a patient many years ago on the bone marrow transplant unit. Before I saw her, her nurse told me that she was pretty terrified. She didn't know if she'd survive because at that time, the statistics weren't actually great for survival of a bone marrow transplant. And when I met her, she told me that she lived near the ocean and that she loved the beach. So when she said she'd like to do a little bit of movement, I offered her a phrase 
where we reached our arms out across the horizon as if we were standing at the shore of the ocean. And we reached down and scooped up a little bit of water and tossed it over our heads and let it shower down. She repeated that phrase. And after a few moments, she took a breath and said, now I know I'm going to be all right. The seashells all just turn to jewels. That image meant more to her than the prognosis and the statistics that she was hearing about. And she knew she was going to be all right. I had my own experience not long ago as a patient. I had to have two eye surgeries in the same day, one in the morning, which was a deconstruction, and one in the afternoon, which was a reconstruction. And I was really anxious about the time in between. So I called the director of the arts and medicine program at the Mayo Clinic where I was having the surgeries and asked if she had a musician who could come and see me in that time in between. She said yes, which was great. I was happy and relieved. And then I panicked. I thought, what if I don't like it? I've dedicated the last two decades of my life to promoting arts and medicine. I'm responsible for programs that employ 18 artists in residence. We offer a master's degree in arts and medicine. I've helped programs, hospitals all over the world start programs. And seriously, what if I don't like it? So the day came, and in that time between the surgeries, two musicians came to see me. And while they played, I found myself both smiling and crying. And I wasn't crying because I was thinking about my situation or any loss or worry. I was crying because the music was so beautiful and it just cracked my heart open in the most wonderful way. And it transformed that moment of pain and anxiety into a moment of beauty and bliss. And it made a difference. And so I kept my job. <laughs> and that's what arts and medicine is all about. Art can't replace medicine. And artists aren't healers, they're not therapists, but they are professionals at facilitating creative engagement in ways that bring meaning and distraction and enjoyment to people when they're in hospitals. I still live for that high that I experienced in the gym that day and for the meaning that I found in volunteering in the hospital. And for me, all of that is amplified when I see the arts making medicine and the patients it serves more whole. Even Hippocrates, over 2,500 years ago, recognized that medicine needs to heal whole human beings when he said, for the great error of our day is that the physician separates the soul from the body. Medicine can do extraordinary things today, and with the arts, it can do more. Thank you.